We're in Romans chapter 9. This is lesson 35. And we're going to pick up in verse 9, 8 and 9, where we left off last week. Recall, we dealt last week with Paul starting this issue of his heart for Israel, that they might be saved. Uh, Now, this is interesting because up until Paul in history, God had only been dealing through Israel, and yet Paul was sent to Gentiles with a message, a mystery message about the church, the body of Christ, which we've learned about the last eight chapters. And so in chapter 9, he begins talking about what happened to Israel dispensationally. Why has not Israel received the promises that God has uh, promised to them? Okay? Uh, and what it, what's happening to Israel right now? Where are they? Who are they? And so in Romans 9, verse 4 and 5, remember that Paul described who the Israelites were and what the promises that God made to them were. He lists there the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the law, the service of God. Uh, of course, all the promises there. Uh, the fathers were theirs, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. So they're overall. So these are the things that God gave to Israel, but they don't have them. In fact, if anything, he was talking in the last eight chapters about how uh, the Gentiles experienced some of these things by grace, not by a covenant, and yet these people who are covenanted by God and chosen by God don't have them. Verse 6 is the most important verse in describing this idea of what happened to Israel when Paul says that they are not all Israel which are of Israel. And so I have on the board here uh, essentially what we talked about last week and how Paul said just because you're Abraham doesn't mean you're a child of promise, doesn't mean you'll receive the inheritance. And so Abraham had many children, well, two at least, uh, Isaac and Ishmael. Uh, Ishmael was not the child uh, of promise. Okay, He was the one that Abraham tried to have on his own. Remember back there in Genesis, uh, he said in Genesis uh, 16, 15 and 16 that he doesn't have a son, so you know I'm going to have my own. And uh, God said, that's not the one I'm going to give the promise to. So Ishmael was born, he was circumcised, he was part of that covenant of circumcision even. And yet he's not the child of promise. Isaac was the child of promise. And so we saw that in Romans 9, uh, down in verse uh, 6. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac thy seed shall be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. Of course, Isaac also has two children. He has Jacob and Esau, twins. And yet Esau... Even though he was from Isaac, a child of promise, he was not chosen of God. Okay, and so he had Jacob. And of course, Jacob had the 12, his 12 sons who made up the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob's name being Israel, given to him by God. And so you have Israel. And so what Paul is describing in Romans 9, 10, and 11 is even though God chose Abraham, even though he gave him the, the seed, gave Isaac the promise, gave, chose Jacob over Esau, and Israel came from the fathers, not all of Israel is, is going to receive the promises. And so I have here the remnant that down throughout history, there's a faithful remnant who obey God's covenant with them, who receive God's mercy, receive God's promises. And there's the rest of Israel who are disobedient and reject the covenant, even though they've, they've been given it. They're, they're, dis, they're disobedient to it. And so God uh, does not give them the promises. Now we'll see later tonight that one example of that is the generation in the wilderness that died in the wilderness. They didn't even enter in. They were, they were delivered out of Egypt as God's chosen nation, and yet they didn't enter the, the promised land. Why? Because they were disobedient to God's, God's instructions. Okay? So you had just a remnant enter in there in the promised land. And so that's what Paul is trying to describe here in Romans 9. Being born of the flesh, being born of the flesh of Abraham, Isaac, and even Jacob, does not guarantee Israel that position as inheriting God's promises. So being born of the flesh was not sufficient to be children of God. They had to be, can we say, born again, right? Uh, they had to be born of the flesh as well. You couldn't be Israel without being Israel. Okay, that's the issue. A Gentile couldn't say, I'm going to be Israel because I want to be. Uh, no, you can't. Okay, you have to proselytize. You have to circumcise yourself. You have to, you have to become an Israelite if you want to be one. Right? A Gentile could not be a Jew unless they converted and proselytized and circumcised and everything else. They got into the covenant. Uh, and that was fine. Um, but the point is that you have to be more than just born of the flesh. You have to be born of the Spirit. You have to be born in obedience uh, to God. John 3, that, by the way, is the issue of John 3. People go there and talk about being born again so often, and that's what Jesus is trying to explain, is that, hey, just because you're of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Israel does not mean that you're going to get this kingdom that I'm preaching about. John 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I stand to thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. And so, of course, the question he's asking is, how can I enter into my mother the second time? They understand he's talking about flesh birth. They know that they're from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They know they're the seed of Israel. But Jesus says it's not just that. It's something else. Okay? So you can't enter the kingdom of God without being born of the Spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. 
Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye, Israel, uh, he's saying to Nicodemus, the singular, ye, Israel, must be born again. Ye is plural. And so Israel has to be born again. The Israel that enters in will be those obedient to what Jesus was preaching, him, him as the Son of God. Okay. And so Romans 9, verse 8, then, they which are the children of the flesh, uh, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. What a bold statement. Because back here, God said to Abraham, in your flesh, from your flesh, he said, your seed will be you know, my, 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 my promised people. Okay? And in Isaac, he said, from you, from your flesh, in your seed, will be my promised people. And so Israel was the flesh. But here Paul's saying that they of the flesh are not the children of God. There's a qualifier to that. Right? You can be of the flesh in Israel and not be the child of God. The children of the promise are counted for the seed. It was only those who take part in the promise, in the provision God makes for Israel. They're obedient to what he says. They're the ones that enter in. The flesh doesn't guarantee anything. Okay? And so if we go back there to Genesis 17, 19, uh, we can see where this principle is taught in the law, in Israel's books, in their history. Genesis 17 is back here when Abraham already had Ishmael and God's giving him the covenant of circumcision and Abraham, because he had Ishmael first, because Ishmael was his firstborn son, okay, he wanted Ishmael to be the one God received. And God said, no, it's going to be the one that I promised you, not the one that you made on your own. Okay, Genesis 17, verse 19. God says, Sarah thy wife shall bear... Well, let's back up a couple here. Verse 17, Abraham fell on his face and laughed after God said that, that Sarah, his, his barren old wife, would have a, a son. And uh, he said, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. To see, Abraham's even offering Ishmael as, Look, here's the son, he's from my flesh, just like you promised it would happen. Okay, And yet God says, No, uh, this is not from your wife. I mean, it's from your flesh and your wife. Okay, she's your bond servant, which, of course, will be important later in some other doctrines in Scripture. So God would not allow that to happen. It had to be the one of his promise. And, of course, he knew that Sarah was that old. He knew that she was beyond childbearing years. And so if she had a child, it would be of God. It would not be just of the flesh. Okay, that's why he said that. That's why Ishmael was not acceptable. And so in verse 19, God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And so he chooses Isaac here. Look at Genesis 18, verse 10. This is 18, verse 10. Here's where the, the Lord appears to Abraham. And uh, in verse 9, he asks, Behold, where is Sarah, thy wife? Uh, Abraham says, In the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. She could not have children. It was beyond her time. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I have a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? An important question and a lesson learned from this. Okay, we'll see later as we go through some of these uh, examples that Paul quotes in Romans 9. God puts these events in the Bible for a purpose. They are not just bedtime stories. They're not there just, just to give a history of things that happen. Every event listed in your Bible is there for a purpose. Okay, it's there to communicate some doctrine to help us understand something about God and his relationship with humanity throughout the ages. Okay? And so God here uh, approaches Sarah and he says, uh, he says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Look back at Romans chapter 9. Paul here is using this and quotes Genesis 18 as evidence that, hey, it's not all the children of the flesh, it's the children of promise, it's the child who is of God that's important. Romans 9 verse, verse 8 says, the children of the promise are counted as the seed, even though there's more seed, only the children of promise are the ones counted of God of the seed. Okay? And in verse 9 it says, this is the word of promise. 
And so th- this is another important verse because we cannot make this promise that uh, Paul's talking about in Romans 9 to be anything you want. Okay, this is not the promise you get when you put your faith in the, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, of eternal life and heavenly dominion and all spiritual blessings. That's not this. Okay, we saw the, the, some of the promises in Romans 9, 4. We also see in verse 9 the promise defined. What is the child of promise here? At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. Genesis 18. Okay. So the promise is that God is going to do it by his word. The promise is I'm going to produce in you a son who will inherit the land. will be a blessing to the nations. Uh, he'll have a, a mighty nation come from him. Right. The promises he gave to Abraham and Isaac. Right. And so Romans 9 verse 9. Talk about that promise. That's important as we get down through the, the passage here. That he's talking about the promise God made for Israel. Not the promises he gave to you. And yet we learn the spiritual lesson here that uh, when God does his, uh, chooses a purpose, he gets it done. He doesn't count on the flesh to do it. Okay? And so, moving on, look at Romans chapter 9 and 10. Uh, when the flesh fails, the Lord will do his will. He will intervene to make it happen. Okay? So it's not of our works, it's not of our will, it's of God's will. Romans 9 verse 10, not only this, not only is it the children of the promise that are counted for the seed, and the promise came through Sarah, which was Isaac. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, we're going to skip the parentheses for a moment, down to verse 12, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. So again here, we've got Ishmael and Isaac, and God says, no, Ishmael is not of God. He's of Abraham, but he's not of God. He wasn't the child of promise. Isaac was of God. God miraculously allowed Sarah to have a baby. right? And then from Isaac, you have Jacob and Esau. So you have Rebekah, Isaac's wife, and she had twins, Esau was the firstborn. Esau was the rightful heir of Isaac's promises, of his inheritance. And yet God said, while they were conceived, before they were born, the elder shall serve the younger. Okay, so this is another important lesson. We have this taught back there in Genesis, we'll go back there in a second, where God is saying, I'm going to make the choice. You're not going to make the choice. Okay, and uh, Isaac didn't choose Jacob. All right, if you go back there and read it, he didn't. He had Esau lined up. He said, go get the meat. Come back, I'm giving you the blessing. Right? And he got tricked. Remember that? And so he got tricked. And, and so Isaac, being a man of his word, once he gave the blessing, he's not taking it back. Okay? But he, he, was, he was trembling back there because when he learned that Jacob deceived him, okay, uh, he knew that his firstborn is not going to get it. Okay? But God said that before they were born. God chose before they were born that Jacob would receive it. All right? And so it says here in, in verse... Uh, 10, not only this, not, not only was it through Isaac, but when Rebekah conceived by one, even our father Isaac. Notice in verse 10 some very important words uh, that give us a time reference. When we rightly divide, when we study the Bible on a chronology, it's important to understand time elements when God gives them to us. And in verse 10 says, when Rebekah also had conceived, it was said unto her, verse 12, the eldest of the younger. Do you see that? When Rebekah also had conceived. Now, this is important because as we cover verse 11 here, you're going to see John Calvin and the Calvinists go way off track and say, before the world began, God had a decree about whom he would love and whom he would hate. Okay? That's not in the passage. The passage is talking about Abraham, Isaac, and when Rebekah had conceived, it was said unto her about Jacob and Esau. Right? This is not an eternal decree before the world was created. Right? There's nothing like that in the passage. And we're going to cover that as we go on through. But that time element is so important. Okay. Now, in Romans 9, verse 10 also, don't get tripped up over the fact that Paul says, even by our father Isaac. When Rebecca also conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. Okay. Uh, it was asked by me last week, and it's a sincere question. And it's something we should consider. Why does Paul say our? Is Isaac our father? I said last week that nowhere it says that Isaac is, is the father of us, the church body of Christ even though it talks about Abraham and our spiritual relationship with him. But what, why do you say our? Well, of course, Paul was a Jew. Okay, Paul was a Jew, but he could also speak to Jews. Remember in Romans, this very book, Romans 2.17, Paul says, thou art called a Jew in Romans 2.17, when he's speaking about Israel in Romans 2, and he's talking, apparently, to a Jew. He says, thou art called a Jew, and you boast in the law, and yet you can't keep it. And so there's times in Paul's epistles, Romans especially, where he's talking to Jews. If you can call back, what, some 40 weeks ago, where we talked in Romans chapter 1 about the introduction, about who could Paul be speaking to, one of the options was that Paul was writing to the very Jews that he met with in Acts 28 in Rome. So he wrote a letter first, said, here you go, read this, we'll discuss it when I get there. 
right? And so he, in Roman Acts 28, he gathers these Jews together and he talks to them about this. All right? So that, that's an option. There are Jews in Rome. That, that's the issue. And so Romans 9, he's dealing with that. So he's not only a Jew himself when he says, you know, my father, our father, he's talking about himself, but he could also be talking to a Jew here. Romans 4, verse 1, he says a similar thing. When, when Paul says, what shall we say then that Abraham, our father, obtained of the flesh hath found? Well, he's talking there about him being a Jew. He's talking about Jewish issues in, Romans, in the end of Romans 3 and the beginning of Romans 4. Okay, Romans chapter 7, verse 1, Paul says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. Well, who would that be? Israel, right? And so just because Paul is speaking uh, 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 about Israel things, about prophecy, does not mean, hey, we need to take this book and throw it back into prophecy and take this book and throw it in the trash. Because we're Gentiles. We can only read things that are purely Gentile. This is not true. Okay? Romans 15 says all things were written for our learning in the Scripture. And so all Scripture is profitable. And just because Paul's speaking to a Jew does not mean he's not speaking to you. And it also doesn't mean that you're a Jew. Okay? So there's a lot more discernment needs to happen than just saying, uh, well, are you, are you a Jew or not? Well, there's more than just being a Jew as we're seeing as we're learning. Right? You can be an unbelieving Israelite or a believing Israelite. Okay? And, and apparently, in Peter's group, you can be a believing Israelite in Peter's group or a believing Israelite in Paul's group. So you see, there's a, there's a lot of different options here. And so don't get tripped over the fact that Paul says, our father, Isaac. He's a Jew. Isaac was his father. Okay? So anyway, uh, moving on from there. Uh, the time element, of course, is that when Rebecca had also conceived, she was, re- she was given the statement, the elder shall serve the younger, which is a prophecy. Okay? Which means that God knew it was going to happen. He declared the, the end from the beginning. In verse 11, the parenthesis says, For the children, Jacob and Esau, being not yet born... Uh, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, it was said unto them, the elder shall serve the younger. And so it's important, again, to go back there and see what's going on in Genesis 25. When Paul quotes these just one or two sentence quotations from the Old Testament, go back and read what's happening back there. A failure to do that, a failure to get the context, will cause you to get all sorts of strange doctrines. Because you think Paul is the first one that said it. Okay, And he, he wasn't. Uh, that's exactly why we went back and studied Obadiah and Malachi for two, two or three months. Okay, to get some context to why Paul would even use that scripture. Right? So we need to do that with all the scriptures that Paul quotes here on prophecy. Um, Genesis 25 is where Jacob and, and Rebekah are, are trying to have children. And down in verse 20, uh, well, 21, he finally gets Rebekah as his wife, Isaac, and treated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Do you see that in verse 21? She could not have children. This is interesting. We saw the same thing with Abraham and Sarah. Now, again, with Isaac and Rebekah, his wife can't have children. Right? Why is it that all the women that God's men choose can't have children? Well, I wonder why. Because God is creating the nation himself, and it's going to be a lesson. You didn't do it. I did it. Right? So every time, even their fathers, when they have babies, God did it. And so we learn from Abraham that it wasn't just because Abraham had a son, it's because the the son of promise that God chose. And and Isaac's wife couldn't have a baby, and so uh, he entreated the Lord for his wife. Oh, yeah, Genesis 25, 21. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Miracle of miracles. Okay? Verse 22, the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And so, if I'm going to conceive because of the promise that, you know, my husband's a God here, then, then why are they struggling? The Lord said unto her, verse 23, two nations are in thy womb. Oh, wait a minute. There's only two babies in there, folks. Two babies, Jacob and Esau. And yet, the Lord says two nations are in there. What's this mean? That means God didn't hate Esau in the womb. We'll learn this a little bit later. God doesn't hate unborn babies. Period. He doesn't hate unborn babies. If you're a Calvinist, he does. Okay, you have to say that. Because they think that God chose whom he would hate before they were born. So he hates unborn babies, some of them. Okay. But oh, this is not true. God says there's two nations in your womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. He's talking about two nations. He's not talking about Jacob and Esau even individually. Calvin would say that Paul is explaining here salvation to individuals and how God elects individuals to salvation before the world began. He's not. He's talking about nations in Genesis 25, 23 and how God's purpose from the beginning was not Abraham, the singularity. It was the nation that would come from him. Right? He said, I'll make you a mighty nation and you'll bless the other nations. God had a purpose bigger than these people. And God has a purpose bigger than you. 
And so when people read this and say, well, God's got a special plan for your personal individual life, you know what? That's a little selfish. God's got his own purposes, and it's not according to your will. It's not according to your works. He's got it. You can get in with it or not. His will is the issue. He revealed some of his will to Abraham about a nation, to Isaac about a nation. He told Rebecca, you have two nations inside of you, and the elder shall serve the younger. Nation, right? The two nations there. And so in verse 24, when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment. And they called his name Esau, which means red. Okay, so the firstborn who had the right in the culture, the right by heritage to get the get what Isaac had to give him, uh, did not get it because before they were born, God said, Isaac's going to get it. He said, or excuse me, Jacob's going to get it. The younger shall serve the older. Okay, and so <clears throat> down, back to Romans 9, verse 11. For the children, uh, when Rebekah had conceived and they were struggling and God said there were two nations, when the children were not yet born, so before Esau popped out, neither having done any good or evil. So that they weren't struggling, fighting, and God saw, look at Esau, he's kind of mean. He didn't, he didn't look at their works. He didn't look ahead and say, you know, Jacob, he's going to lie, so, you know, demerit for him. Esau, he's going to you know, do worse than that. He wasn't looking at their works. They're babies. Babies don't do good or evil. You see, these doctrines, these lessons that God gives to us in these, these events that happen in Israel actually teach us a lot of things about how, who he is and how he deals with things. Okay? These babies not having done good or evil. And so how is it that God's going to make his choice? By his choice. It's his choice. He's going to choose one. Okay? Of course, God sees the end in the beginning and that sort of thing, but it's not going to be based on their works. It says right here, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God... Now, just to remind ourselves, what's the purpose of God? That's talking about the context. The purpose of God for Israel. Right? What's the purpose of God? Well, that's a special purpose God has for your life and your life. No, it's the purpose that God has for Israel. The question we're trying to answer is what happened to Israel and God's purpose for them. Right? That the purpose of God for Israel, according to election, might stand. Otherwise, it wasn't according to God's election. You know how it works? Whomever Isaac blesses, he gets it. Right? How does it work? Whomever's the better person, he gets it. But no, God chooses through whom he will do his purpose. And that's what you learn with Jacob and Esau. You know, with Ishmael, Ishmael's mother was Hagar. So Ishmael's mother was not Abraham's wife. A little suspicious back there about whether that was actually legitimate, right? These guys are twins. No question there. They're both conceived in Rebekah, the person that God said would have the babies, the one he caused babies to be born, and yet only one of them is chosen. Right? So this is what they're learning here. Also that when we get to Romans 9, also that we look through Israel's history, we can say not all Israel is Israel. Look back here. Isaac, Jacob, God chose them by his will, not by their works. Right? Well, we're circumcised. We follow the law. That doesn't make any difference. It's by God's choice, his election, that God's purpose is performed. Now, you have an option. After God declares his purpose, after he chooses how it's going to be, this is my purpose today in this dispensation. God's purpose is to see men saved by the preaching of the cross and put your faith in what Christ did on the cross, dying and resurrecting for your, for your salvation. You can either get in with that and accept it and you know, believe that purpose or reject it and resist it and harden yourself against it. That's always been the case. And we covered back in Obadiah in detail, four weeks back there, about Esau's problem. Remember that? And how Esau, it wasn't that God hated Esau when they, before they were born, or even after they were born. Okay? It wasn't that God said, you know, Esau, you're condemned to hell before the world began. There's no way that you're ever going to be pleasing in my sight. He just said, you're going to serve your younger brother. And we saw that there was Esau in his own heart. He said, I'm going to slay that guy because he stole my rightful blessing. Well, he, what he should have learned is that God will choose whom he wants to get his blessing, even if Jacob deceived us for God to choose through whom his purpose will be performed. Okay? It's not for Esau to choose. All right. And, and so in Romans 9, verse 11 here, it's, it's the purpose of God according to election. His election, by the way, might stand not of works, not of the works of the children, but of him that calleth. There was a reason why they struggled so that Rebecca would say why, so that God would tell them why. He would say the elder shall serve the younger. OK, very important that, that we understand that uh, the election is about choosing how God's purpose will be fulfilled. Look at Ephesians 1, 11. In Ephesians 1.11, Paul has the privilege of knowing the mystery of God's will. We're talking about God's will in Israel's past, for Israel. 
Paul is talking about the mystery of God's will and the dispensation of the fullness of times. So this is future beyond everything that, that's finished. And he says that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and on earth. So we see there the twofold purpose of God, even in him. In whom? In Christ. Also we have obtained an inheritance. So we who are part of the church, the body of Christ, we who have believed the gospel, the preaching of the cross, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. You see, it's not your will. It's not someone else's will. It's God's will. He works things after his own counsel. And what he worked was that Christ would die for the sins of the world, revealed that to fall into mystery. And we are then predestinated to be in Christ for eternity in the cessation of the fullness of times. That's our, de- our destination determined before by our being in Christ. How do you get in Christ? Ephesians 1, verse 13. You trust the gospel of your salvation. After you're believed, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Okay, that's how you get in Christ. So again, we're not saying anything here about what Calvin would pretend to, ha- uh, to be, which is that God, before any of us were ever born, before the world began, chose who would be saved and who wouldn't, and that's that. No, what we see is that God, before the world began, had a purpose. And revealed through history his purposes. And he taught us that he's the one that chooses through which his purpose will be performed. And we have a choice to get in it or, or resist it. Okay? It's always been the case. Back to Romans 9, uh, verse 11. Uh, the end of the verse there says that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. So again, the point of the parenthesis is that the election is of God, not of the men. Okay, that's why he emphasizes that it was told them before they were born. We have to emphasize it's not of their works, but of God that calleth. Uh, the question we need to ask is, how does he call? Again, another controversial doctrine in the Calvinist system. You know, all the doctrines of Calvinism fall on each other. If one breaks, all of them break. Okay, they depend on each other. And so when you have uh, the election being the before the world began, then you've got to have predestination before the world began. You've got to have the calling, you know, be something else. But it's very clear what happens when God calls. God calls all throughout the scripture. He calls with his words. He calls with his words saying, this is what I'm doing. What are you going to do? Right? That's his call. God says, I'm over here. You're over there. What's up? Right? He calls you to follow him. He calls you to obey his words. He calls you to say, this is my word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's his call. Now that call changes in the Bible. Right? That's important. What he's calling people to do today, put their faith in the death and resurrection of Christ for salvation is different than what Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry was calling people to do, to be water baptized and follow him into the kingdom. Right? But God's call is always, get in with my purpose. I'm bringing salvation. I'm bringing the kingdom. I'm going to do something great. Okay? And so it says in verse 11, it's not of works, but of him that called it. God is the one that sets the agenda. He's the one that declares the message. He's the one that declares the end from the beginning. All right? Esau had a choice to heed God's call, and get into God's purpose or not. It was not foreordained before the world began that Esau would be the one that God hated. Okay? When, when you don't read verse 13 in the proper context, and you think verse 13 is talking about before the children were born, then, then apparently there is no other conclusion. God hated Esau before he was born. Okay? And we'll cover that here in a moment. But the fact is that Esau was not hated of God even after he was born. You see that back there when Esau had opportunity to bless Jacob. In fact, later in their lives, Esau did. Remember when Jacob came to Esau and they hugged? They, were, they, they got back together, right? So what happened? That God said, I hated Esau. All Esau had to do was bless Jacob, as the promise said, and he would be blessed. That's all he had to do. Okay? But Esau's nation, those two nations that came out of Rebekah, Israel and the Edomites, which was the nation coming from Esau, they were at war with each other. It was always provoked by the provocation of the Edomites. And we saw back there in Obadiah, we covered in detail, every time the Israelites ran into the Edomites, the Edomites resisted them. They got in their way. They tried to kill them. Okay? And so that is why Obadiah, written hundreds of years after Genesis 25, hundreds of years after Jacob and Esau were both dead, God says, Esau, you're going down. Okay? He's not talking about Esau, the man. He's already dead. He's talking about the nation. Right? So Romans 9, 13, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Paul is saying here that God said before they were born, by his choice, by his election, the elders shall serve the younger. He chose Jacob. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Why does he quote that? Why does he quote Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated? 
which is a quote from Malachi chapter 1, he does that because that verse shows that God chose Israel, not Edom. Right? Because that verse is written at a time, Malachi being the last book of the Old Testament back there, where you can look at Israel's history and Edom's history and see which one was chosen of God. Which one received the blessings, the promises, and the law, and everything else. It was not Edom. All right? Even though he was the firstborn. So as much as the Edomites would, to, to the day that Paul wrote, argue that it was Esau's right to have that, that privileged inheritance, it was not God's choice. All right? So there's a very big difference there. In Genesis 20, uh, back there in Genesis 25, um, Rebekah conceived and, and gave birth to Jacob and Esau. Uh, we'll see later that Jacob deceived Isaac for the, the inheritance. And yet it was God that later appeared to Isaac in a dream and gave him the vision of the ladder from heaven down to Bethel. Remember that? God chose to do that. It wasn't because Jacob deceived or didn't deceive. It wasn't because of Esau's works, good or bad. God chose Jacob. He chose him before the womb began that he would perform his purpose through him, through the younger. Okay. In Romans 9.13, it says, Jacob have I loved. Why did God love Jacob? Remember back in our Malachi studies, Malachi 1, 2, and 3? Go back there and just read Malachi 1 and 2 real quick, just before Matthew. We uh, recall that God is unburdening himself to Israel. Why is he unburdening himself to Israel? Because they're disobeying his commandments. The whole book of Malachi, he's, he's cursing the priesthood and he's, he's telling them all the things they're doing wrong. Right? And yet Malachi 1, 2, he says, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? And then God answers, was not, Jacob, uh, was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. What heritage? What mountains? I thought the children were still in the womb. I thought before they were born, God hated him. No, the mountains and the wilderness uh, were the place that Esau's children's children's children lived. Called the Edomites, in verse 4, whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished. But we will return. The Lord says you will not return. I will throw down and destroy your high places. Okay? So it was Esau's children that was the issue. The whole book of Obadiah shows this. You know, Obadiah is the smallest book in the Old Testament. You'll say, why it's there? It's there to show you, Romans 9.13, why God hated Esau. Obadiah, verse 10, says he hated Esau because of his violence towards his brother Jacob. And he's not talking about the people. He's talking about the nations. Okay? Esau's nation, Edom's violence against Jacob's nation, Israel. Since Jacob was the chosen one, since Jacob had the blessings, and his, the promise was if you bless him, you'll be blessed. If you curse him, you'll be cursed. Esau was cursed because Esau's nation did not bless Jacob's nation. Right? God's purpose was, bless my people. And they didn't. Right? And so his purpose was standing by the election, by God's choice, not by Esau's right. And so... Um, in Romans 9, 13, he hated Esau, not the person, but the nation. Obadiah 10 describes that. God's purpose was through Jacob, though, if you look back at Genesis 27, I told you before that uh, it wasn't the will of Isaac that Jacob received receive the promise, which is fascinating. Nowhere before the uh, promise to, to Rebekah do you find Jacob being chosen. Okay, uh, It's only when they were conceived and they were struggling in the womb that God told Rebekah that the younger would be the ruler. Um, but Isaac didn't know, apparently, because in Genesis 27, <clears throat> verse 10, it says here, uh, Isaac tell, before he's going to die, Isaac tells his elder son, Esau, go now to the flock, fetch me from thence two good kids of the goats. I'll make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. And thou shalt bring it to thy father, and that he may eat, and that he may bless thee, before his death, Isaac says, I'm going to bless Esau. I'm going to die. My eldest son's going to come. He's going to make me a great meal, and I'm going to bless him. It's going to be good. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man. I am a smooth man, so on and so forth. And so what's going on here is that uh, Rebekah and Jacob's scheme, of course, you know the story, to, uh, to, to deceive Isaac, he's half blind, to get the inheritance. Okay, drop down to verse oh. Way down to verse uh, 20, maybe 30, 33, 32 and 33. After Jacob leaves with the blessing, Esau comes back. He makes his venison. In verse 32, Isaac, his father, said unto him, Who art thou? 
And he said, I am my son, thy firstborn, Esau, the one who deserves your blessing. In verse 33, Isaac trembled very exceedingly. Why did he tremble? He thought he gave Esau the blessing. So it, he, Isaac's will was that Esau, the firstborn, would get the blessing. And it wasn't according to his will. It was according to God's will to choose Jacob. Right? So whose will trumps who? God's will chooses, uh, trumps Isaac's will. Right? So it's, it's God's will, not his will. Um, go back to Romans 9 and verse 13. The point, of course, we don't make up God's mind. He chooses who receives his promised purpose. This is going to be important as we learn later who the remnant is because the, those unbelieving Israel, those not in the remnant, are going to cry foul. They're going to cry, hey, we're of Abraham and Jacob. We're of Israel. We deserve it. Right? And the lesson they need to learn is, hey, God chooses who gets the promise. And so you have to do what God says. When God comes in the flesh and says, be water baptized, follow me, I'm the son of God, and they don't. Okay, that's not getting into his purpose. Uh, the remnant re- did receive the Lord and did become sons of God. Romans 9, verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Right, is there unrighteousness with God? What's he talking about unrighteousness? Well, we just, we just learned that, that the firstborn wasn't given the right. right? The secondborn was. And Jacob deceived him to get it. Everyone knows that part of the story, and everyone has that question mark. Why did God continue on with this? If Jacob deceived Isaac, what a weird story. You know, it's kind of a shame, a huge shame, that Jacob would lie to his father, and he gets the promise. Why didn't Esau get it? He was wronged. Right? And so the question that we're facing here is, is there unrighteousness with God? Is, is he taking the side of the liar and the deceiver just because he wants to make that choice? Is he an unrighteous God? Of course, verse 14, God forbid, God's not unrighteous. But why isn't it unrighteous that God chose Jacob over Esau? No, huh? No. Because it's not according to their works. Because Romans 9, verse 11. Remember that? He doesn't choose based on their works. We're looking at it as if Jacob was the liar. God is not looking at their works. He has a purpose. He's, I'm going to get it done. I'm choosing you to do it. You say, well, that guy's a liar. He's a sinner. I don't care, God says. I'm choosing you. He's a chosen vessel. Remember Acts 9, verse 15? Saul was killing Peter's group. And Jesus told him, you're my chosen vessel. God, Saul was a sinner, right? That's the whole point of the dispensation of grace, is it not? Right? This is why Paul is apt and able to teach even the New Testament to Israel because he understands God's manifold wisdom for all ages. Right? And we're learning things about Israel's own writings, about how God operates in humanity, even with the remnant of Israel. That's what we're learning in Romans 9. Okay, so is there unrighteousness with God? Of course there's not unrighteousness with God. God is righteous. We saw after Jacob lied, and he had to run away from his family, because, uh, or he was, he was sent away from his family, uh, because Esau was so angry at him. All right, Back in Genesis 27, uh, Esau said in his heart, after he learned that Jacob deceived his father, and after he hated it and despised the blessing that Isaac gave him, which was a secondary blessing to serve his younger brother, um, you know, Esau said, I'm going to slay my brother when my dad dies. Right? His anger filled his heart. Okay? And so he, uh, J- Jacob was sent away. In Genesis 28, when Jacob was sent away, God appeared to Jacob. He never appeared to Esau and said, Esau, I know, you know, sorry about that, you know, but Jacob did deceive your father. and it was, We have to follow cultural protocol, and he gave the blessing. That wasn't it. God chose Jacob. He appeared to him in Genesis 28 and said, I'm going to, through you, give the same promise I gave to I- Abraham and Isaac. You'll inherit this land, he said. He was sleeping on the Bethel rock there, right? And through your seed, the nations of the world will be blessed. Right? God chose Jacob. It wasn't unrighteous because God made the choice, apart from their works. Romans chapter 9, verse 15. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, on whom I will have mercy, uh, and on whom, I read this totally wrong. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now again, Paul is quoting Exodus 33. A statement that God himself said in the Old Testament to Moses. But it's important we get the context. Because if we don't, we think this is all there is to it. We're going to read the next couple of verses and see that God has mercy on whom he wants. God hardens whom he wants. Apparently, God, before the world began, chooses some to be damned and some to live forever. Not true. He's not talking about that. He's talking about God's ability to, to have his will done, his purpose performed by his own choice, his own will. By election. His election, his choice. Okay, let's go back there and look at Exodus 33. Let's first go to Exodus 20. 
God forbid that he be unrighteous. God chooses who will get his mercy and how. Okay. Remember, we all deserve death. Romans 3, 3 verse 10. Romans 3 verse 20. We're all sinners. God doesn't owe us anything. If God were just a righteous judge and that all was all that he was, we'd all go through life and get slapped in the face every time we did something wrong by God, and we'd die, and we'd go to face him in judgment, and we'd all be condemned to hell. Right? There's no righteous basis that God can give anybody grace, except for Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, right? So God is the one that chooses the means, the basis, the, the people even, that he will give mercy to, and whom he doesn't. He chooses how he'll give mercy. Look at Exodus 20, verse 9, or verse 5, rather. It says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself, uh, bow down thyself uh, to the, the idols, nor serve them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. You see that? So he visits iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. God is not capricious. God doesn't say, you know what? I've chosen these people to be damned, these people to have life. So whatever happens to you people, it's because I preordained it to be. There's nothing you do to get out of it, right? You can love me. You can cry out to me. I'm not going to listen to you. You're condemned. What is he? he says, for those that hate me, they've got to hate him for him to visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and so on and so forth. Verse 6, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So apparently in Exodus 20, those that love him, he shows mercy. So is this preordained before the world began? No. He's saying, here's my commandments. If you love me, I'll have mercy. If you hate me, I won't. Right? This is, a, a, this is a, his prerogative. Okay, this is God is the judge. He doesn't have to show mercy to anybody, but he said, if you love me to my commandments, I'll show you mercy. Right? Nobody could live the law perfectly. They should have understood that. The law taught them that, the knowledge of sin. And yet God was offering mercy to those that loved him and kept his commandments. Okay? God has the ability, he has, has done, chosen how he will give mercy. Exodus 33, 19 is the verse that Paul quotes in Romans 9. And it's important to know the context. I wish we could read the three chapters here. We don't have time to do that. But uh, you probably should study out what's going on here. Because this is when God gave this covenant to Moses. Remember Moses went up to the mount and he was up there 40 days and God's writing down the commandments and towards the end of the time. Uh, meanwhile, back on planet Earth, uh, you had Israel making a golden calf and worshiping it and dancing all around it. And God gets angry. Okay. In Exodus 32, uh, look at verse 32, verse 9 and 10. God interrupts his uh, little seminar with Moses and says, Therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. What's thee mean in your Bible? Thee is singular, right? Ye and you are plural. God says, I'm going to consume them down there, dancing around that golden calf. And Moses, I'm going to make a nation from you. Wow. He's upset. <laughs> All right. Apparently, someone's not loving him and keeping his commandments. Let me see. Uh, so in verse uh, 11, Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains, to consume them from the face of the earth? So Moses is now pleading before the Lord, saying, don't consume them. Remember your promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Think of the Egyptians, what they're going to think, right? And so Moses is pleading on the behalf of sinful Israel, for the sake of God's character, right? He's not even doing it for the sake of these people. He's saying, it's for you, God, for your name. Don't kill them. Okay? God's angry. Exodus 33, the next chapter. Um, 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2, God says the same thing. He says, Moses, depart and go up hence. He says, Moses, you leave, and I'm going to send you, he says, to... Uh, he says, Go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. So God is focused on getting his purpose done. You see this? You see how God here does not show... How do I say this? God's more interested about his purpose being done than he is about individual people, whether they're in it or not. Whoa, is that a heresy or not? Because in today's modern gospel, you always preach, you need to have a personal relationship with Jesus, and God loves you. God so loved you and you and you. 
No, God has a purpose that he's trying to get done. You have a choice. God's giving you the privilege to take part in that purpose or not. And if you don't, God won't hesitate to say, fine, have what you want. I'll do it without you. Okay? Back here, God's own people that he, he protected through the plagues in Egypt, that he delivered out of Egypt miraculously. Right? He's provided for them in the wilderness. He's ready to just go, I'm going to kill them all. I'm going to consume them all. I'm going to get my purpose done with you, Moses. These guys don't want it, apparently. Okay? And so it says, verse 2, I will send an angel before thee, Moses, and drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite. He said, you don't need these people, Moses. Moses, you don't need this nation. Right? You can do it. I'll put an angel in front of you. He'll slaughter all these people in the promised land. You'll enter in. And he says, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. He says, I can't take these people in. I will not do it. And when the people heard these evil doings, they mourned, of course. I mean, no one else to be threatened that way. They should have thought of that before they stopped serving the God who brought them out of Egypt. Okay? Is God wrong to be angry here? Is he unrighteous to say, this is horrible? Is he, is he wrong to say, I'm going to consume them? He's a consuming God, a consuming fire. Right? He's a righteous God. That's why he's saying these things. Of course, Moses pleads with him. Uh, and down in the chapter, look down in verse 18 and 19. Oh, verse 17. The Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing. Moses says, if I have found grace in your sight. Moses says, if I, not these people, if I have found grace in your sight. I'm asking you not to kill these people. And in verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Okay. The reason why God doesn't consume Israel at this point is because of Moses. Moses only. There's a lesson in there somewhere. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. That's what Paul quotes. Why does God say that? Why does God say I will be merciful to whom I want to be and gracious to whom I want to be? Because for the last few chapters, he's saying I'm going to consume these people for their sins. And all of a sudden, this judge who says I'm going to consume them for their sins says I'm not going to consume them. On what basis will he not consume them? It's a righteous thing that he does consume them. He says, because I can be merciful to whom I want. Right? That's a righteous judge. He can, you're right. The judge can be lenient, the judge can be merciful, the judge can be gracious, and even though the guy is guilty, he can say, the sentence isn't going to be that harsh. Right? Why would he do that, though? To get his purpose done. Right? He's got the purpose done here, and Moses asked him. Moses mediated here and says, if I find grace, then do it. So he says, I can do that. So back to Romans 9, verse 14. Is God unrighteous then to choose Jacob over Esau? No. no. Because remember what Moses said? God can have mercy whom he wants, even if they were sinners. Even if Jacob was a liar every day of his life, God could say, I'm choosing him. On what basis? His mercy. His compassion. Because he has the choice, right? It's not based on works. It's not based on whomever's will. It's not based on your opinion. Okay. We'll see later in the chapter, people actually respond to God and say, God, why are you doing it that way? I've had questions like that. You've had questions like that. Why is God doing that? Well, you know what? You don't get to ask that question. Because God's the one that sets the purpose. All you have to do is learn God's purpose. He's revealed it here. You learn it and you do it. Why did God do it that way? Well, that's because he's smarter than you. <laughs> Okay, and that's because he just wants to do it that way. That's his. Okay? And so in Romans 9, verse 4, 15, we see here the reason why Paul's quoting this is not because God picks, I'm going to, be, I'm going to save you, and I'm not going to save you. He gives mercy to sinners. And we'll see here in a moment that there's some people he does give mercy to. And he has the choice to do that because it's his prerogative. Okay? And so um, in verse, where are we at? Romans 9, verse 16. So then... Now that we've learned that there's no unrighteousness with God, and God chose Jacob even though he, he deceived Isaac. And so then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. That's what we've been learning all along. It wasn't of Abraham's seed. It wasn't of Isaac's will. It wasn't of Jacob's works. It was of God, of God, of God. Every time. Right? It was of God. So it's not of him that wills it. It's not of him that runs it. It's not the one that says, I'm doing what, you know, what I think you should do. You know, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter your works. God will choose what he wants. Okay? It's of God that shows mercy. It's not you to give mercy. God is the one that gives mercy. Okay? And so we see here 
the principle at work. Well, I put on your outline there when it says, so then it, you need to ask, what is that it there? So then it is not of him. It is of God, right? It is not of him that wills. It is not of him that runs. It is of God. What is the it? Calvinists want to make that salvation. Let's read it like that. So then salvation is not of him that wills. Salvation is not of him that runs. Salvation is of God that shows mercy. Well, that's not what Paul, what he's talking about in the context here. He's talking about the purpose of God for Israel. Okay, so then the purpose that God has is not of him that wills. The purpose that God has is not of him that runs. The purpose of God is of God that shows mercy. Okay, that's what was going on back in Exodus 33. That's what was going on with Abraham, Abraham Isaac, and Jacob. It had nothing to do with their personal salvation. Esau could have been saved. Ishmael could have been saved, right? The, the people who uh, bowed down to the golden calf, if God didn't consume them, they could have repented and been saved. In fact, that, they were given opportunity, weren't they? God showed mercy. They continued on. And it wasn't, God didn't curse them in the wilderness until later. <laughs> Remember that? So they had opportunity after opportunity. And they continually resisted God's mercy. Okay, Like Paul said in Romans 2, God teaches us his mercy in the Old Testament. It was God's will and work that provides mercy, not Israel's will, not Israel's work. Okay, Remember, we're eventually trying to get to this point where we're looking at the nation of Israel and saying not all of Israel gets it. Right? Not, of all, not all of Israel gets God's mercy. Well, some of it does, and it's not because of their works. Ezekiel 36, verse 20, Ezekiel's talking about the New Testament, and Ezekiel's talking about a time when God had brought a curse upon Israel. Uh, Ezekiel's writing in captivity uh, under Nebuchadnezzar, right? Why is he in captivity? Because God brought curses upon his nation. <laughs> right? he, he, he destroyed Jerusalem, he kills the kings, and Ezekiel 36, verse 20 <coughs> God says here that he scattered them, verse 19. I scattered them among the heathen. God admits it. He confesses it. It wasn't a wrong thing that he did. He said they signed a contract. They broke my law. I was continually merciful. I was continually long-suffering. But you know what? That doesn't last forever. There's always a time of judgment that will come. And God brought the judgment. He gave them warning. He gave them due process. And he brought the judgment. He scattered them among the heathen. They were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings. I judged them by that covenant. Right? So, you know, we're all sinners. And so God is righteous to judge. They didn't want my mercy. And so I gave them what they wanted to judge them by their doing, by their works. OK. And then in verse 20, when they entered into the heathen, whether they went, they profaned my holy name. And they said to them, these are the people of the Lord that are gone forth out of the land. So what a shame that God said. Remember, see what the focus is here? God cares about his purpose. He cares about his word. Psalm says his word is held above his name, right? They're probably related. His good name, his reputation, is reflected by the words that he says. He says, I will make you a mighty nation. You know what happens? God himself has to scatter them throughout the nations. How does that reflect on God's own promise? Not good, right? People say, apparently God can't do what he said he was going to do, right? Not good. What's it mean on people today say that Israel will never return? Israel will never get God's promises. They're, they're giving up. That's a bad reflection on God's promise that he made. They're spurning God's character. Right? Ezekiel 36, verse 20, he says, They profane my holy name. In verse 21, But I had pity. I had pity, God said. So why is it here he's going to offer them a New Testament, a second chance? Because he had pity. Pity on what? Pity on those sinners? No. He doesn't have pity on the sinners. He has pity for my holy name. He says, I, from the beginning to the end, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. And you know what? I said it was going to happen. This was my purpose. And they're not going to stop it. Right? He says, for my name's sake, which the house of Israel hath profaned among the heathen, whether they went, therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whether you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen. And he seems like he's concerned about his name. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it? His purpose, what he said would happen. Not about the people. He, he's telling them straight out, you guys didn't do anything right. right. Paul's not talking about salvation in Romans 9. He's talking about God's purpose for Israel getting done. What happened? He says, The heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. God said he'd do it through Israel. He'll get it done through Israel. If that means this generation isn't it, they're gone. The next generation, they're gone. The next generation, they're gone. There's going to be a generation that receives those promises and God's name will be rectified. Right? All nations will see that I am the Lord who sanctifies you before their eyes. And you know what? We learn later 
that if God kept pursuing that Old Testament, it'd never get done. <laughs> right? That's why the New Testament, God says, I'll give you my Holy Spirit and cause you to do these things. He's got to do it, just like he did Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's got to do it. Because they can't do it on their own. Right? This is the lesson of, of Israel's Old Testament. This is the lesson that they should have known. Paul's teaching us in Romans 9. What happened to Israel? I'll tell you what happened. They didn't follow his purpose. They were rejected. And they, God was, Jesus was preaching the New Testament there, and they didn't get in on that either. Okay? We'll see that in Romans 10. But there were a few. There was a remnant. Right? There was, there was few faithful. Ezekiel 36, verse 24, I will take you from among the heathen, gather you out of all countries, bring you into your own land, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, baptism. Ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. They won't sin. A new heart will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, give you a heart of flesh, put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And so God will do his purpose. It never says here, the individual people he chose. He says, my purpose is going to get done. Okay, the election has to do with God's purpose. The election is Isaiah 45, 4. When God says in Isaiah 45 that it's Jacob that's the elect. Remember we saw that he chose Jacob in Rebekah's womb, right? Isaiah 45, verse 4 says, For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. Okay? Back in Romans 9, it said, by, it, it's of him who calleth. Well, what did he call? He called Jacob by his name, Israel. He called that nation. He'll call them out from all the countries and bring them back by the New Testament, by his spirit. The elect is Israel. Why is it Israel? Because Israel was God's, uh, crucial to God's purpose for the earth. Right? You say, who in Israel? Well, that's a good question. But it's not about the individuals. It's about the nation. God had a covenant with the nation, not the individuals. The individuals could be cut off. Genesis 17, if they weren't circumcised, they're cut off in the covenant. But the covenant's still there. The nation's still there. The promise is still there. God's purpose will be done. Okay? So back to Romans 9. Let's continue on here because we have a huge issue to cover in the remaining four minutes that I have in my hour. <clears throat> you all know I'm not going to stop at an hour. Romans chapter 9, in verse uh, 16. It's not of him that wills, not of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. God must do it. It must be of God. Right? That's so verse 17. For the scripture, and by the way, unbelieving Israel rejected the Son of God. Right? So that's going to help us identify who the remnant is. For the scripture, verse 17, saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose. What purpose have we been talking about since Romans 9, verse 1? The purpose of God for Israel. What does Calvin say this is? Oh, this is the purpose that God wants to save everyone. And so Pharaoh must not be saved. And he preordained him not to be saved before the world began. No, the purpose is that God had for Israel a nation will be a blessing to the other nations. For the same purpose have I raised thee up, Pharaoh, that I may show my power in thee, and that my name, we just read about his name in Ezekiel 36. It's about the name, not individual salvation. That, the, that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. You see the earth there? How many times do we cover our dispensational chart and say God in the beginning created the heaven and the earth? God had a purpose for the earth. And purpose for heaven was kept secret. What is his purpose for the earth? That Israel would declare his name. That Israel would say, you know, God's our God and he dwells with us and all the nations get blessed through them. Right? So why was Pharaoh back? Why do you take up so much of Exodus back there? So that God can get his purpose done. Right? Why did God deliver Israel out of Egypt? So his purpose could be done. Right? Why did Pharaoh not repent? So that God's purpose could be done. Right? Now, here's the question. Why didn't Pharaoh repent? <laughs> right? And this is where people get into the controversy. In verse 18, Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardens. Hardens? <sighs> well, that's it. We've got to throw away the other pastors. Apparently, God chooses people to go to hell. People, other people go to heaven. No. Mercy doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Mercy says you're guilty, but I'm not going to give you the full sentence. Okay? Hardening is not going to hell. Hardening is not showing mercy. He's a hard judge, man. You broke the law, you're getting a full sentence. That's what hardening is, okay? You say, well, this full sentence is hell. Well, if they keep it up, unless they got a payment, unless they can get some grace, unless they can plead for mercy, unless they can repent, unless they can get in God's purpose, right? Whom he will, he hardens. How does he harden? Who do, how does he choose who to have mercy and who's going to be hardened? According to his purpose, right? That's how he chooses. According to his purpose, the election might stand. His purpose, choice. 
So how do you get mercy? How do you get hardened? Well, it depends on how you respond to God's will. Isn't that the whole story? His purpose? God has a will. Even today, God has a will. How you respond to his will determines whether you're going to get mercy or whether you're going to be hardened. Okay? You're saying that you can do whatever you want and be saved by trusting what Christ did on the cross for your sins. No, I'm not saying you can do whatever you want. But they're hardening themselves against the gospel because they don't want that. They want to prove it themselves. Ishmael. Esau. I'm living Israel. You see the difference? It's not of God. It's of the flesh. Right? It should lead you. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Because we say it should be of God. Totally of God. And here's a great message. It's all of God. Right? We did nothing. Okay? And yet, people reject that. Why? Religious people reject that. Church people reject this. They reject the gospel. They reject God's will. And they harden themselves against grace teaching. Why? It's easy believism. Apparently not. <laughs> you know, they, people harden themselves against it. Okay? And so, it was about God's purpose getting done. And that determines whether they receive mercy or not. Um, look at Psalm 95, verse 8. How is it that people get hardened? How is it that Pharaoh was hardened? We're going to cover that here. Psalm 95, verse 8. What I'm seeing is a consistent theme throughout Romans about God's purpose for Israel being accomplished. What I'm not seeing is Paul delving into unknown mysteries of predestination and election according to John Calvin. By the way, John Calvin said that the mystery given to Paul was predestination before the world began. So, I mean, he wrapped the whole thing around that. All right? Um, I don't see that. The mystery of Christ is about a, a new creature, the body of Christ, that was not known in the prophets. But in Psalm 95, verse 8, it says here in verse uh, 7, For he is our God, the Lord is our maker, we are the people of his pasture. Uh, who is the we? Israel. Uh, and the sheep of his hand. Who are the sheep? Israel. That will help you with a lot of passages in Jesus' earthly ministry. The sheep are Israel. And he is their shepherd. Today, if you will hear his voice, verse 7 says, Harden not your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Interesting. So you have here uh, God recalling back in the wilderness when, when he delivered Israel from Egypt, and people hardened their hearts. And verse 9 says, When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work, forty years was I grieved with this generation. And said, it is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Because they hardened their hearts, right, in the wilderness back then. Remember that? Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, the hardening of their hearts happened when, uh, when it wasn't when they worshipped the golden calf. That was when Moses pleaded for them, and they got mercy. The hardening of their hearts is when they were approaching the promised land, and they sent out 12 guys, remember that, yeah. to check it out. And one came back, Caleb, and said, let's go in. And the other guys go, ah, we're not doing it. And God told them, I will destroy these people for your sake. I said, we don't want to. Okay. They resisted God's purpose. And he said, fine, you're going to die in the wilderness. Okay. So it says here, harden not your heart as in the, day, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Why were they in the wilderness? Why didn't God create limos out of thin air and they can drive through in limos? You know, the wilderness is tough. They were saying, God, why'd you bring us out here? It's tough out here. The test. God says that. It was a test. He was testing. He was proving them. Their hearts. Right? Not their physical ability. God would provide for those things. It was their hearts. If they did not want to follow God in the promised land, they would say it out. A lot of people died out there in the wilderness. A whole generation, in fact. Okay? But they didn't want it. So it says, don't harden your hearts. You know, hearts get hardened. People wonder how do hearts get hardened. It's really simple. Okay, uh, you can do it. You've done it. I've done it. Okay. People harden people's hearts all the time. And then they come to Romans nine. And they say God hardens hearts here, and they ask. Apparently, He's reaching inside spiritually and not letting you choose things that otherwise you would choose. That's not what you do when you harden people's hearts. You say, how do I harden people's hearts? You know how you do that? You speak plainly to them. Okay. You you know every time you you try to explain someone right division what it means to harden someone's heart. You're trying to tell someone the dispensational chart that water baptism is not in this dispensation. And you know what you do? You waffle. You know what you do? You're gentle. You're, uh, oh, well, let's, let's deal it another way here. Okay, that was wrong and heresy. You know what, let's go over here and do it. That's how you deal with them. You're showing them mercy after mercy. You know what you could do? If you think water baptism gets you saved, you're going to hell. No, you stand at someone, what they do? <laughs> I don't like that. 
They just harden themselves. But you know what you choose to do? Have mercy on them and say, even though you're wrong, I'm going to try to convince you, persuade you, cajole you. Right? I'm going to be apt to teach. But you know what it means to harden your heart. Someone does that to you. Someone emailed me the other day. They didn't like one of the statements on the website. Okay? And it was a statement about a, it was a personal statement. It wasn't a doctrinal statement. Okay? Don't ever harden your hearts against personal statements. Don't let that sticks and stones, there's some saying about that. Break your bones, words never hurt you. I don't know if that's true or not. But, you know, w- harden yourself with right doctrine. There is a good way to harden yourself. You get in right doctrine, you get in God's will, and that's where you solidify yourself. You get strengthened. Read the scripture. Stand on God's word rightly divided and strengthen yourself. Get harder and harder and don't move from that. Make sure you're right. <laughs> According to the Bible. Okay? God's will. That's how you need to harden yourself. But if you harden yourself against people who preach and teach because you don't like the way they look, you don't like what they're saying about other people, you don't like their attitude, you don't like the way they smell, that's not the thing to get hardened over. Okay? It doesn't make a difference. Yeah, that's what people do, inevitably. They say, I don't like the preacher, I don't like the way he says that. I don't, I don't like that mean joke. I don't like that word that he said. You know, who cares? What is his doctrine like? Did he teach the right thing or not? Is he doing God's will or not? Right? That's how we judge and discern all things. But let's go back here and see how Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Look at Exodus 3. You know how to harden people's hearts, and you know how to soften them. The truth can do either one. All right? And God, so that his purpose might be done, and God wanted to display his power, he wanted to show his wrath. You know how he appeared to Pharaoh? The God of the universe? I mean, Pharaoh, not Jehovah. That's who he thought he was. Okay, he was the ruler of the world. Egypt, the greatest kingdom in the world, was his. And here comes this guy from the desert. And he says, let my people go. What? Who are you again? And who is this God that you say you serve? Right? That's not going to work. It's not going to fly. He hardened his heart. People always read that and say, well, I wonder how he did that. It must have been before the world began. It must have been kind of a, a secret behind the scenes. You read the words... How would you feel if you were Pharaoh? We say I wouldn't be Pharaoh. Well, that, that's what happened. Exodus chapter 3, verse 18. Put yourself in Pharaoh's shoes. Not, not a good thing to do, put yourself in sinner's shoes, right? Exodus 3, verse 18. Exodus 3, verse 18 here. Yeah. They shall hearken to thy voice. Thou shalt come, and thou, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt, and you shall say unto him, the Lord God, by the way, the things that Moses and Aaron said to Pharaoh, God told them exactly what to say. He didn't say, go preach to them, go beg of them, go beseech them. He said, this is what you're going to say to them. Okay. He says in verse 18, the Lord God of the Hebrews, they were slaves, right? Remember that, they were slaves. The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go. That is not a request. That is a command, right? Let us go. We beseech thee three days during the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Notice here at the beginning here, they're just asking for three days leave. Not even asking. Let's go forever. They're saying, let's go in the wilderness for three days. Okay. This is part of the hardening process, by the way. Because they could have explained the whole deal. Well, there's the, there's the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He gave promises. He, he did miracles, you know, and he wants us to have a purpose on the earth and this sort of thing. And, you know, they, they didn't do that. Instead, they went directly to, to the Pharaoh and said, you know, God said, let us go for three days. And later they said, he wants you to let us go forever. Right? You're not going to have us anymore. Uh, hardening is hard. It was a process that God was doing here. Verse 19, God says, I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. How does God know? He says, I, I, he says, I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. How is he so sure? Is it a wild guess? God sees the end from the beginning. Isaiah 46, verse 10, right? You know, but not only that, okay, I mean, we, we can give God that, and that's obviously more than any of us have, seen him from the beginning, but it's not just that. Because God intervenes in history, especially during this time. And so God has something to do with what's going on here. It's not just him looking back, passively, going, yeah, I see the end there. It's not going to let you go. Because God <laughs> does a lot of things. Okay? Uh, God sees his heart. You know, Hebrews 4 says that uh, the word of God discerns the, the thoughts and intents of the heart, but, you know, God is able to do that. He's able to see what you're thinking. He's able to to know whether you're bad or good and this sort of thing. Okay? And so, Exodus 3, verse 19, he knows the heart of Pharaoh. He knows the pride that's in Pharaoh. He knows the sins that are in Pharaoh. 
And he knows if you tell him this, he will not let you go. By the way, you in your limited capacity have also been able to do that as well, especially young children, boys and girls. You know what your sister or your brother will do if you provoke them. Right? I know if I pull her hair, you know, she's going to scream. <laughs> I know it. Now, you don't know it with certainty, of course. God knows it with certainty because God knows more than you. You can't even see into the heart of your sister, and yet God can see into the heart of Pharaoh. Okay? So he knows exactly what's going to happen here. And God makes it happen. And he says, and after, he will let you go. He says, uh, verse 19, that he will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. Mighty hand. What's he saying? The only way Pharaoh's going to let you go is if I destroy him. The other way. He's going to go into death. Okay? And so God says, I'm going to let it happen. It's going to happen. I'm going to harden it. I'm not going to give mercy after mercy after mercy. I'm going to let it happen. I'm going to give judgment after judgment after judgment. I'm going to slap him around, showing my power. And you're going to be my people, delivered from this evil nation. And the whole world will know that I am God, delivering you from Egypt. Right? God does not want to, at this time, give mercy and mercy and mercy and mercy to Pharaoh. He doesn't have time for this. He's got a purpose to get done. And he'll get it done right now. He had a prophecy given to Abraham 400 years later. It'll happen. Right? He's got a purpose to get done. And so God can choose to give mercy or not. He chooses not to. Pharaoh, could he have repented? Could he have said, what happens if Pharaoh would have said, you know what, Moses? I've heard of this God of Israel. I've heard of Abraham. And you guys should be on your own. And I should serve you. Here, take all my wealth, take all my gold, and my blessing, and go. You know who gets the glory for that? Jehovah God. Did you hear the Pharaoh of Egypt? Just bowed his knees down to the God of Israel? Either way, God's purpose gets done. Hallelujah. Right? But God knew he wouldn't let his people go. Right? He knew it. And so we see, this. there's a whole lesson on this. On the website, there's a lesson titled, Could Pharaoh Repent? And we cover all these verses in detail about how God hardened Pharaoh's heart. What I'm trying to explain here is that there's a process to it. God intervened to do it in a way that you can read in your Bible, not in some secret before the world began way, where Pharaoh, there's no possible way he can choose anything else. Pharaoh was given choice after choice. Every time Moses spoke to him, he was given a choice. Moses said, will you let people go, or will you face plague? And Pharaoh, every time, chose the plague. Now, there were a couple times um, where he didn't. Look at Exodus chapter 9. Exodus 9. In verse 27, there's a few times where Pharaoh, um, Pharaoh said, I've sinned against your God. Uh, will you beseech your God for forgiveness for me? Okay. Well, I thought Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And he does that, and as soon as God gives forgiveness, that little mercy that he does show there, Pharaoh hardens it again. Okay. Exodus 9, verse 27. Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron. This was after the plague of the hail and everything like that, killing all the animals and stuff. And, and he said unto them, I have sinned this time. <laughs> this time. He's not there yet. But he said, I've sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. Quite a declaration from the Pharaoh of Egypt here. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough. That there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone to the city, I will spread abroad my hands to the Lord, and thunder shall cease. Neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know how that earth, the earth is the Lord's. Amen. God's purpose gets done, right? But as for thee and thy servants, I know that you will not fear the Lord God. And the flax and the barley was smitten and, and, and so on and so forth. So if you look down in verse Exodus, uh, chapter 9, verse 33, uh, Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread abroad his hands uh, unto the Lord and the thunders and the hail ceased and the rain was not poured upon the earth. And when Pharaoh saw it, the rain and hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart. Go right back to it. Apparently, this repentance was not a repentance unto salvation, as Paul talks about. It was a repentance just to say, we want to get out from underneath this hail. <laughs> right? We don't like that anymore. The heart of Pharaoh was hardened, neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken. Of course, the Lord's always right. The Lord said it would happen. He knew his heart. He knew what would happen. Um, look at Psalm chapter 10. We'll finish up. Whom he will, God gives mercy. Whom he will, he hardens. And it's always according to his purpose. It's not according to some capricious list of individual people being saved or not. There's always a provision for salvation in the Bible for everyone. Okay? It doesn't mean that everyone gets the same amount of mercy. Israel got mercy after mercy. Israel sinned. God gave more mercy. Right? Uh, people who opposed Israel, not as much mercy. Uh, we're in Psalms 
chapter 10, God uses the wicked for his purposes. You've read that in the Bible. You've heard that in the Bible, or even the wicked God uses for his purpose. And that's because God is smart. Okay? That's because God is wise. That's because God is mighty. All right? uh, we do not need a God that has rigged the system in order to give glory to himself. In fact, that would be the opposite of getting glory to himself if he's rigged the system. How, in fact, does he give glory to himself if he's chosen what everyone's going to do anyway, and he's made them do it, and he caused Adam to sin, and every sin that you've done is for his glory because he caused you to do it, and he sends you to hell because he gets glory from it, and everything else. That's not glory to him. What's glory is that God creates people with the ability to choose, to serve him or not. And throughout history, God is in control of his purpose. God is not in control of history. He's control, in control throughout history because he has a purpose he's going to get done. Okay, That's the difference. Calvinists say he's control of history. Whatever gets written down is because God caused it. Right? The other option is that, hey, God's intervened throughout history and he'll get his purpose done because he's God and he has wisdom above any man and he has the ability above any man and he'll do what he said. Okay? Psalm chapter 10 in verse 2. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. God uses the wicked against themselves. They try to oppose him. He uses their opposition to get his purpose done. Let's think through this. This has happened more than once in the Bible. Pharaoh tried to oppose God. God fought back with plagues. That was a bonus, by the way. Because after Israel was delivered out of Egypt, all the nations feared them because the God of Israel cast plagues on Egypt. Right? Jesus came. Israel crucified him. Right? God said, that's the mystery of Christ. You've just now salvation to the world. Right? God uses the devices of the wicked, like a cross, a crucifixion. Devices they have imagined to do his purpose. Okay? For the wicked boast of his heart's desire and blesses the covetousness whom the Lord abhors. God does not glory in the death of the wicked. He does not glory from the wicked. Unlike John Piper and every other Calvinist who's consistent in their doctrine, God does not get glory from sinners. Okay? He doesn't. He despises sin. He'll deal with sin. He dealt with it on the cross. He will judge sin in the end. If he hasn't throughout history. And he does not get glory in their death. God does not come down and say, I will be glorified because I'm going to kill you for your sin. Which would be a righteous judgment. But it's not glorious. If God went throughout history and every person died because of their sin, his purpose would have failed. Okay? His purpose is to get glory from people who are righteous. So his purpose is not just getting people to be good, but getting them to be justified. And how can he do this? Jesus Christ is the answer. We know, of course, how all men be justified by faith in Christ. Right? How his purpose will be done. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23. Is God talking about individual salvation in Romans 9 or talking about his purpose in nations? Ezekiel 18 talks about how he wants the unrighteous to repent. And he wants those who are righteous not to stop being righteous. It's not that they're preordained to be one or the other before the world began. Ezekiel 18, 23. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Answer, no. It does not please God that the wicked should die. Did it please God that Pharaoh kept resisting him to the point that his whole army drowned in that sea? This verse says he doesn't get pleasure in that. Right? Now, you can get pleasure in Israel was rejoicing and dancing on the sidelines there because they were delivered. Now, that's pleasurable that God delivered them. But he turns around and looks at all the slain and says, that's a shame. Right? That's not where the glory comes from. Okay? The fact that God is powerful to part the waters, that's glory. The fact that he, he did what he said to do to deliver Israel on dry ground, that's glory. The fact that Pharaoh resisted and killed his whole army just for the sake of hardening himself against God, that's not glory. Okay? That's a shame. Ezekiel 23, he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, uh, said the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live. God wants the wicked to return from his evil ways. Look down in verse 31 and 32. Cast away from all you, uh, cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. God doesn't want them to die. Okay? It wasn't God's intent for Esau, Ishmael, I'm leaving Israel, not to get what God promised as a blessing to the world. And yet, they resist him. Is 
They resist his purpose. And even unbelieving Israel resisted God's purpose in Jesus Christ. Uh, Israel received Jesus Christ. Christ came unto them, and they received him not. Okay? That's not a pleasure to God. God has pleasure in these people. It pleases the Father, uh, Jesus said, Luke 12, 32, to give you, little flock, the kingdom. He gets pleasure in them. Okay? That's where the glory comes from. And those that fulfill his purpose. And he, of course, it's by his choice, it's by his will it gets done. All right, we're in Romans 9, verse 19 next week. We'll be dealing with the potter and the clay and all that business. More Calvinistic problems. This is really the, uh, the fertile ground for Calvinism. I'm hoping that I'm enlightening you a little bit on the context of what Paul's talking about. Any, any, any questions?